the Ghost Story Salon. I'm Jolie Holland. I'm a musician and a first-hand ghost story collector. Uh, today we're going to talk to Will Stenberg, who's a poet, a musician, and a screenwriter. And he wrote us a song for this episode. We're going to talk to my beautiful cousin Kate, who has a really classic haunted house ghost story. And then I tell her one from my extensive collection. And then we're going to talk to my amazing colleague, David Poulter, who, look him up. He's done so much amazing stuff. He was in the Pogues. He was musical director for uh, Tom Waits's musical, The Black Rider. He's done a lot of amazing theater work. Um, he's worked with Robert Wilson. Um, his story involves some punk icons and some icons of experimental music. Um, and it was the first time I had ever heard that story. So it, it was, it really shook me and I'm really happy that I could even go to sleep that night. Uh, and he plays us a song on musical saw. And then the last segment, I play a song that I learned from Michael Hurley. It's called ghost woman blues. Uh, it's by this guy named George Carter. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a really sweet song. It's, um, it's a, it's a cool story. But right before we started playing, like right after I pressed record, the neighborhood coyotes started singing like 12 feet out of this window. So keep your ears open for that. And David Coulter recorded Saw over the piece. And I want to thank Adam Brisbane for providing the interstitial music. Um, it's from his Halloween album that you can find on Bandcamp. Uh, and the song is called Skeletons. And lastly, I want to thank Valeria Pinchuk, who made our poster. Um, thanks for being here. Happy Halloween. <laughs> Things are about to get spooky up in here. Things are about to get spooky up in here. I'm gonna tell my story and I'm gonna make it clear. Things are about to get spooky up in here. Things are about to get spooky in this joint. Things are about to get spooky in this joint. Gonna tell my story and I'm gonna make my point. And things are about to get spooky in this joint. Things are about to get spooky up in here. Things are about to get spooky up in here. Gonna tell the story of the disappearing deer and things are about to get spooky in here. Yeah, that was a great intro. This is Will Stenberg, everybody. And the story of the disappearing deer is pretty amazing. All right. Tell us about it. All right. Well, you know, I picked this story out of my, all the options, you know, in my life because you and I were housemates at this time in Portland, up here where I'm recording. It was um, early February and it was a, a particularly harsh winter. It was very snowy. I know it was February because of an, an event that occurred um, shortly after this, which I'll, I'll mention, but, but yeah, we were living in a house, me and you and, and like my partner at the time. And yeah, we had a real big snow event, you know, like unusually it's, Portland's gotten snowier, but it was pretty massive. Like the city shut down, it's not, you know, Portland's not equipped to, to handle like that amount of snowfall and it was beautiful and eerie and you know, so that weird dampening of sound that happens, you know, when snow falls. And yeah, so me and, you know, my partner at the time is, we left 
the house early in the morning and it was fresh snowfall, fresh, deep, thick snowfall in the yard there. And, and we noticed a track, a trackway, you know, animal tracks. But immediately, like it stopped us, it froze us in our movements because something didn't seem right about it. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, I'm not a tracker, you know, but like I grew up in the country. It was uh, clearly deer tracks, you know, unless I'm badly mistaken, they're pretty like easy to spot. Yeah. And they started in the middle of the yard, you know, like in a fresh snowfall with everything around them was pristine, like virgin snow. Yeah. And then boom, right in the middle of the yard, the tracks began. And I still, you know, I still can't really, and there's more, you know, like, I'm just pausing for a moment to say that, like, I still don't have a, like, a good skeptical explanation for that. It was pretty weird. It was like 20 feet from anywhere that a deer could have come from, right? Yeah, exactly. There was, there weren't bushes or um, foliage that it could have crawled out of. It was just fresh, you know, unmarked snow all around the first tracks. Yeah. You know? Like when I was really reaching, I, I wondered, did it jump from the roof? But that was, is totally absurd, you know? Yeah. Um, but you, know, you reach for explanations and, mm -hmm. you know, a deer couldn't have even gotten up on the roof. So um, it probably didn't jump from the roof. And if it had, it wouldn't have landed like with such precision. So anyway, like you could Ugh. like forget about that. So crazy. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's why I like the story is it's not really a ghost story per se. It's just a, a phenomenon. It's just an, 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 an inexplicable event, you know? Right. Um, and, and nobody, and, and like, like any ghost story, the, it really just rests on whether or not people want to believe you yeah exactly yeah and you know it blows your own mind and anybody else could just choose not to believe you or if they're your friend like me it's you know i didn't see the deer but it's this like pure thing of wonder for me because i know that you're not a bullshitter and i know that you're not trying to impress me like you're just sharing the weirdness right yeah, i think about that a lot with like paranormal stuff because a lot of it rests on stories like occasionally there is physical evidence but it's mostly stories and yeah nine times out of ten people lie for gain they lie for a purpose you know right there's some reason why people lie generally you know, they lie for attention maybe like but i'm not out there trying to write a book about the disappearing deer, you know, uh, it's just a thing. It's just a thing that happened, and you know, it doesn't fit into any neat box of no. like supernatural either. You know, no. Um, it remind me of something that I, I want to bring up that I I don't think I've mentioned before. Okay, it's like not like I don't make a personal correlation with this, but when I was a little kid, I used to read. I've always been into the, like the supernatural, and I used to read these. Mm -hmm pendium books that are like true and amazing stories or like you know they were just stories of you know ghost ships and like you know spirits and bigfoot and yeti and all mm -hmm. mixed together in these books i loved them and there's one about they called it the devil's footprints and mm -hmm. they happened in devon england you've been all over the world have you ever been to devon england uh, yeah, and I, I don't remember much about it just because I was on tour and like not sleeping enough, you know, but but I have been there. I don't know anything about it, so I was just curious, but it was in like 1850, I'm just going to say or somewhere in there, and there mm -hmm. was a like it became a big craze because there was a trackway and with their religiosity of the time, they immediately were like, it's the devil because it was like cloven hooves right but like there's no real correlation there it's just like ho ho cloven hooves you know totally um, it was like a hundred mile trackway and it did weird things like jump on like jumped over 
haystacks and jumped on roofs and it did things that are not that don't make a lot of sense in the natural world Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway thinking about doing this interview with you I thought about the devil's uh, book prints or whatever no strong correlation thinking about what to slot this into it's like mysterious footprints you know right Michael Hurley told me a a story and he it was like your story like he had nowhere to put it he was in the woods in Vermont and these three he saw these three red balls gliding above the ground in a in an equidistant triangle just rolling along the ground like going over hills you know and they were about six inches above the ground and there was nowhere he could put it and you know so he couldn't say like oh that was some ufo shit or that was some ghosty shit you know just yeah just some just some like living in the woods not knowing what to say about something there is a literature on that and like i mean i don't know if there's a traditional literature but like yeah. if you go online like people definitely see them so next time you talk to michael you might mention that that like he's not alone the orbs are out there Oh, wow. That's funny. I'll, yeah, that's great. I talked to him a few days ago. It was really sweet. Coming back to the deer story. So it gets, it gets weirder, right? Well, let me ask you, where did the deer appear and where did they walk towards? Okay, well, I mean, they appeared in like the middle of the yard and I'm trying to like, there were like flower beds, weren't there? There was a garden. Yeah. It was somewhere right in the middle of that but the, the geography of the yard was really obscured because it was under so much snow yeah you know, I have a hard time saying but it was somewhere just in the middle is the best I can do the, the weird part is where they went right which was the door to the side door that we had in our bedroom yeah like literally it, they, the, the tracks appeared in the middle of the yard and walked up to our door and then they disappeared. It never walked away from there. Yeah. And so that makes it feel oddly personal. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. To, to me or to her or to us or, and it, it doesn't feel, I mean, it might feel a little ominous because of something that happens that I'll mention in a minute, but. Uh, it's really moving and it, it feels creepy, but because it's natural it also doesn't you know it's explicitly like a deer you know so that feels like it's not creepy it's like bambi it's like a you you know you feel this like affection towards this deer critter and you think well the deer is inherently harmless right if it was some weird man-like footprints it would be like terrifying super creepy yeah oh fuck sorry yeah totally so yeah you know it's weird when the numinous or whatever like just kind of intrudes on our daily lives because in my experience like in books and stories there's always some meaning that is easily discerned or connected to your to what happens next or to your story right but in reality totally random yeah i'll go ahead and I'll, I'll mention that. i was just gonna say and that's one of the reasons why i love collecting ghost stories because sometimes people will tell me the weirdest thing that ever happened in their lives and they have no context for it and i might be able to tell them one or even two stories that someone has told me personally that is very similar And so it helps contextualize things for people. And to me, it just like fills in these pictures of like, oh, this is like, this is part of how the human, this is part of the human experience. This is like part of like how, what happens to us or how we make sense of the world. Yeah, I've, you know, that's always been my philosophy with the supernatural or the paranormal is like, the phenomena is real. And I, you know, across the board, like, more or less, you know, UFOs are real. The phenomena is real. Uh, Bigfoot phenomena is real. Ghostly phenomena is real, you know, but I don't know what the fuck they are. You know, I, I, and like, I don't trust anyone that does. 
Uh huh. I, I will like you know I'll die on the hill of like these are real, you know. So I'm I'm right in that middle ground where it's like no this is fucking real, but you don't know what it is. You're not exactly agnostic. Not exactly. No, I'm a I'm a believer, but uh, but I'm not sure what I'm believing. <laughs> I think that's profoundly i mean this is my bias too but i think that's a profoundly healthy way to deal with this stuff it's so far out i mean i i also really appreciate the hardcore atheists and or you know the like peace i know people who are so religious that they don't believe in ghosts but they have really powerful ghost stories right. and they <laughs> And they don't explain them as being, that was not a ghost. I don't know what that was. No, for sure. I mean, someone who has a really firm, like I have my beliefs and everything like that, but they don't explain everything that happens in the world. Right. Not, yeah, I, I mistrust. I think it, it's, that's kind of a one definition of fundamentalism, maybe, is if you have a, a, a belief system that explains everything. Exactly. <laughs> you know, that's weird. That's weird to me. Yeah. So I, I've never been able to put that experience into a box. Like, but now I'll mention something I've been referencing, which is that, you know, which you'll remember is that a, a dear friend of our, of, of ours died, Jubal. And that was just a couple days after that happened. Mm -hmm. And so it's for me to imagine the cosmology where like a ghost deer coming to our door has anything to do with this person's death. But there's no way I can disconnect them in my mind either because yeah. that was such a profound loss and this yeah. inexplicable event preceded it. And that's, there's a mythology to that, like a harbinger or a messenger. So to me, there's a connection there, but I, I don't know that's real, you know? Right. And it's not, it's not something that's like culturally grounded for us. You know, it's not like the disappearing deer visited me and now I know that death will soon be here. You know, it's like... exactly. <laughs> That's, a, that's an interesting thing that you bring up, though, because, uh, yeah, that's so, so interesting because it makes you wonder if, like, certain phenomena occur and because we're not culturally grounded in them, they might, maybe they don't just occur to people in those cultures, they occur, they just occur in the world, but if you're not, in, if you're not schooled, you have no idea what just happened, you know? Right. In some that's that's an interesting idea and that's really like it, it kind of seems like that's what a lot of us white people are scraping along by oh you know like there's like a lot of spiritual cultural appropriation that goes on well i i can imagine almost a comical aspect of it where like what if the the supernatural world just doesn't even acknowledge cultural separation at all so like you know an angel from the judeo-christian tradition like visits a taoist and they're like what the fuck is that <laughs> and like a native american animal spirit visits an orthodox christian they're like what's going on and it's just like total chaos you know? what if that is what's happening you know <laughs> that's that's kind of what we're positing here demon like visits a catholic and you know it's just supernatural bedlam i kind of that's kind of an enjoyable idea my friend told me a really creepy story about a, a skinwalker mm -hmm. and when he told me the story it we, we really couldn't you know get out the scalpel and separate like was it your were you just given like a, a phobia induction you know because he was like hanging out with these native guys. He had been building houses with them. He'd been working on Adobe houses with them. And he's from the East Coast. And he's like, oh, I'm gonna go camping up in those hills. And they're like, oh, I don't think that's a good idea. And, and like, they told him in really the perfect setting, like around a campfire, you know, like super spooky. And then, you know, he had to like, he ended up having to walk home from the bus stop, like, a, like many, like three miles from home from a bus stop or something. And he walked by this guy on the street and he just like, he just like felt like this guy was, you know, not fully human. 
and it was it's definitely a really creepy story but he and I both were giggling about like you can't take that apart you know you can't really separate the spooky story from you know your own projections of like seeing a stranger walk up to you on the street and the stranger was like a little too personal in a creepy way like he said he passed my buddy on the street and he said the dude's wearing a, a hoodie and he can't really see his face and the dude says hey cousin as he's walking by <laughs> and like he said it was like a real like coyote energy like like a lone wild animal getting a little too close yeah yeah i mean like who Maybe if he hadn't been hanging out with those dudes, it would it would, it would have just struck him as a some weird person on the street. Or mm -hmm. it's creepy too. Hey, cousin. <laughs> yeah, uh, that would be creepy in any context, pretty much, unless it was your cousin. <laughs> it's, uh, the 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 way that you're saying that sounds. I wouldn't want my cousin to be like, like hi, cousin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a little intimate for cousins, you know? <laughs> yeah. On a deserted piece of highway in the middle of the desert, too, passing under a street light. Yeah, which is a really classic place for, like, a trickster to hang out under a street light. Mm -hmm. Out of central casting, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's a really good, creepy image. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your very tragic and beautiful and mysterious life <laughs> it's very sweet yeah. It's not a, yeah no thank you for having me you know i'm glad you're doing a talk show because i've been waiting for it Hey, Jolie. Everybody, this is Kate Usell, and I love I love Kate's story. Kate, tell us all about it. Well, it was the early '80s. I was about 30, maybe 31, and I was renting a room in a private residence in Bel Air, which is a very wealthy area of Los Angeles. Lots of of celebrities and rich people. And Bel Air, what you don't know about Bel Air is it's a series of valleys and canyons. So each house, each neighborhood feels very isolated. Okay. And it's it's really very beautiful. Deer would come down and munch on the lawn. So I was renting a, um, a room for Marilyn. Her daughter had moved out to go to college. I was renting her daughter's bedroom. Uh, and I was working home company at the time. So the first night she hadn't cleaned all of her daughter's things out of the bedroom. And the first night she said, oh, Marilyn was kind of flighty. And she said, oh, I'll take care of this tomorrow. Don't worry about it. And there was this three and a half foot doll standing in the corner of the bedroom and which was evidently the daughter's doll uh, among other things but but was the biggest thing these were a toy that people used to give their children kind of creepy I you know creepy tall standing thing yeah uh, and it was standing in the corner of the bedroom and I was reading and then I turned the light out to uh, go to sleep and the doll was staring at me. Yeah. And, yeah, and when I was reading, it was staring at me. And, yeah. and I kept, you know, I kept trying to ignore it, but kind of its eyes were piercing into me. So I got Marilyn and I said, Marilyn, can we just, remove this doll from the bedroom. You know, it's it's kind of creepy and I, I just don't want it here. She says, oh yeah, no problem. So right outside my bedroom door, 
was a closet in the hallway and she put it in there and it had a hook and eye latch, okay? So she hook and eye latched it. I saw her do it. And she put the doll inside there, hook and eye latched it. And says, okay, everything's fine. We're going to go to bed now. So I went to bed and everything quieted down. And then all of a sudden I heard this rumbling. And I'm like, ooh, what's the bad? And I opened my bedroom door and the, the closet door had come open slightly and the doll was leaning out this way, staring at me. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the worst. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, yeah. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> so a couple nights later, and, and the other thing about Bel Air is it's really quiet. It's not like being in LA at all. It's like you're in the country. So it was very quiet. Yeah. You're, you're, you're insulated from traffic from, and it's full of trees and it's, it really is quite beautiful there. So we're getting ready for bed and Marilyn's bedroom is on the first floor at the opposite end of the house for myself, from my bedroom. I'm up at the top of the stairs and the, the front door is, is at the bottom of the stairs, right? So the doorbell rings and it's, it's like nine o'clock at night. I, I was getting up at 5.30 in the morning, so I would go to bed early. The doorbell rings and I hear someone answer the door and a bit of a conversation. And then I think, well, I hope everything's okay because it's late at night and you know it's just Marilyn and I in the house. So I, I walk out onto uh, the platform that looks down the stairs. And as I'm walking out, Marilyn is coming around the hallway from her bedroom. And we look up, she looks up at me and I look down at her and she says, who was at the door? And I said, I thought you answered the door. And she said, no, I didn't her. And I said, Marilyn, why didn't you tell me this house was haunted? Mm -hmm. And she said, well, I wouldn't rent a room if I told you. <laughs> it turns out that there had been a family in the house previous. She knew that there was at least a little girl and a little boy who liked to play pranks. And the, the adults, she wasn't real sure of. I, you know, a few other little things happened. I went back to bed and I, I basically said, Okay, fine. You know, I'm I'm gonna live here. I'm not gonna trouble you. Just please leave me alone. I need to get up in the morning and go to work. And I really never had trouble after that. Okay? I had a girlfriend who she was she was kind of a not a nice person, and and they gave her some grief. But I I never had trouble. I remember you telling me about the girlfriend that. She, she thought like invisible people were pinching her in the night. Yeah, so. yeah at night. Yeah, she thought they were <laughs> pinching her, and and she would say, "Why are you pinching me?" And, and I'm, I'm not pinching you. And and then the other thing that would happen was it would be a, a dead silent night, and the wind would not be blowing, and there'd be scratching on the screen. <laughs> Well, I, I, it really freaked my girlfriend out, just completely, which made me laugh. I mean, I just thought, you know, these ghosts are just, they're so funny, you know, because they knew who to tweak, you know, they knew they weren't going to get in there with me, but they knew that my girlfriend was just terrified and they just kept, she said one morning she, she went down to the kitchen and a cupboard flew open and, and a saucer flew out. So I have to tell you, I always only have believed what she told me. Exactly, um, yeah. But I do know that there were ghosts in that house. So that's my story. That, my favorite people to collect ghost stories from are, are 
people who are either very skeptical or have a really good sense of humor. So I appreciate your perspective. Yeah, well, I'm both skeptical and 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 I really I just I just enjoyed them. I have to say I I I'm not particularly a ghost believer, but it is what it is. I mean, there these things really happen to me, and I have no explanation for them. And I know Marilyn had other stories uh, as well because she had lived there for many years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But I, I really got a kick out of them. I've collected a few stories from haunted houses. And it's really interesting to hear like all the, you know, like different, different stories from different people passing through the house. Huh. Yeah. Can I tell you a ghost story from San Francisco? Oh, I'd love to hear it. Yeah. It's, it's so creepy. It, it involves a haunted house where mostly lesbians lived. There, there was this, there was this one woman brought over a new, a new date and uh, they'd been having a great night. And the, the new girl gets up in the middle of the night and she, she goes to the kitchen to get a glass of water. And this, this, there's this guy in the kitchen leaning into the fridge and he, the light of the fridge is, is illuminating his face. And he looks up at this, the girl and he goes, he flat out says to her, we just had sex, which was really creepy. And, and then he walks past her and she sees that his hands are covered in gauze. Oh, yes. Oh. Yeah. So she gets, oh, a, that's creepy. it's very <laughs> creepy. So she gets a, she gets yeah. a glass of water and she goes back to her friend's room and she's like she says to the woman who lives there she said your roommate is really creepy and uh <laughs> <laughs> and it's true her roommate was, was really creepy <laughs> extremely creepy and and then you know the, the woman that lived there knew that nobody who lived there was home like everybody was out of town and at, certainly zero men lived in the house. <laughs> uh -huh. That's, that is one of the creepiest haunted house stories I've ever collected. It's just, yeah. it's really extreme. That is very creepy. Yeah. I'm, well, I'm not sure I would have laughed at that. <laughs> no, yeah. no. No. I, I I don't know if I could. Have, I mean, the doll hanging out of the closet is amazing, yeah. and yeah. it is it is in the realm of funny and pinching, pinching the the woman who liked attention and kind of yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of torturing her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that creepy. Here it is, definitely. I, I didn't live there very long. I think I lived there for about six months. I don't, Marilyn said they never been awful to her, you know, right. so, and I didn't, certainly didn't anticipate being scared. <sighs> well, thank you for telling your story. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for asking. It's a fun story. It's an amazing story. Thanks so much, Kate. Okay, Jolie, take care. Love you, honey. Love you. David Coulter, it's wonderful to see you. You look wonderfully spooky do you have a ghost story for us uh yeah i don't really know i mean it doesn't it doesn't really have a like a massively earth shattering punchline but it's very definitely uh it's very definitely kind of like a ghost story sure because it's yeah. like there's absolutely no other explanation for it and it's kind of it's actually 
around about the time that you and I first met, and it's when I was living on Las Palmas in West Hollywood, mm. and I was going in, and I was going into the theatre every day, and I, I, we would we we were living in this house doing, uh, and I was going into the theatre every day doing this really long run of of Waits's Black Rider. Um, and I'd been out there for months, you know, I'd been out there, like I'd gone out there a month before anybody else in the band or in the cast had gone out, new cast members, the songs and stuff. So I kind of was just kind of in, I was just kind of living, you know, in West Hollywood on my own, not really, not really knowing what was, you know, I was just working just flat out anyway. When I so kind of what goes to the theatre and I don't drive. So I was one of these weird people that goes to LA and ends up using the subway. You know, I used to go to on the subways to pay my dollar and get on at Hollywood and Vine and just go a few stops and get off at City Hall and walk walk up past the courthouse and go up to the theatre. Anyway, so this became a routine and we've been there for quite a long time. We were sharing this lovely old house with, with two uh, two friends that were in the cast. And we, you know, we were kind of like bit sort of ships in the night, really. We didn't really see much of each other other than at the theatre. But, you know, we'd kind of... Um, had this little routine and we kind of you know we'd get up sometimes and we'd have breakfast together or we maybe you know we'd all make our own way into the theatre and stuff but we you know we'd always like reconvene anyway we'd been staying there for a couple of months and there was this one particular night that I'd gone to back from the show um, and I'd gone to bed and my two colleagues had also gone to bed and it must have been I don't know three or four o'clock in the morning and I, I sleep very light enough I'm a bit of an insomniac so I never never sleep well at the best of times mm. and there was suddenly this almighty crash from the living room it's just like really big like and it's one of these old houses wooden house that just kind of shook with the mm. shook with the impact of whatever this noise was anyway you kind of all of us kind of kind of got up and, and reconvened in the living room, you know, where this noise had come from. And there, there was a big ass painting that had been on one of the walls. And it was heavy, heavy thing, like, you know, big. It was like so heavy that it was one of those things they had like kind of two hooks in the wall to support it kind of thing. Right. Like this thing wasn't going nowhere. It's like Yeah. And anyway, this this picture frame the picture in this frame was was on the other side of the room mm -hmm. it just kind of it had got it had come off the wall and it had obviously i don't know what had happened but it just shot across the room and it had crashed into the other side of the of the room and it was just like lying on the floor so that was so that was one and none of it there was there was zero there was just no explanation right there were just times where you know we would all we would all feel that there was some if ever any of us were there on our own which was quite regular um we would always feel like there was somebody else in that space yeah um it's just off it was just off a of sunset you know and it's just start by that um it's by the high school out there so i don't know i you know i don't know how much I don't know how much bad stuff went down on North Las Palmas Avenue, but anyway, it was just like that was very, very strange. That was a very strange experience. So same house, fast forward maybe a month, and um, I'd met you at this point. We'd kind of just done a session with our dearly, our dearly beloved friend Hal Wilner. We'd been doing our sea shanties over in that studio in, in LA, and so I kind of you know well into the run of well into the run of Black Rider, um, you know, kind of well over the hump, you know, well over halfway. And um, similarly, you know, I kind of got back late one night after work, kind of sat on the porch with a drink and just kind of watched this, you know, watched the sky and went to bed. And like similarly, similar kind of time, you know, middle of the night, three, four o'clock. Um, just was suddenly aware that my one of my colleagues that we were sharing with was in his room playing guitar, singing. 
at kind of four o'clock. This is Richard Strange, funnily enough. Wow. And um, and Richard was, you know, and I thought, God, you inconsiderate bastard. You know, it's just like four o'clock in the morning. Why would you do that? It's so rude. It's like, you know, we're sharing a house. It's like electric guitar. No, 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 no. Just like a, just he had, the, but we, we, he and I had done some shows in Japan and he just bought a new Takamini acoustic guitar. And he just mm-hmm. had this, this guitar that, you know, that it was just always like, he kind of always like left it on the chair in his, in his room and, and he would, and he would play it, you know, he would play it at kind of all kinds of godforsaken hour, hours of the day and night. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so I just thought, okay, I'm not gonna, you know, it's not worth, it's not worth going there. I'm just gonna stick my head on the repello and you know, turn turn on my headphones a bit louder and just, you know, put some of that Brian Eno ambulance music on and then kind of, you know, go to go back to sleep. Mm-hmm. After that twenty minutes, it's the, the the it started again, you know, and I thought, oh bloody hell, this is really annoying. Anyway, so I kind of eventually got to sleep. It stopped. I eventually eventually went to sleep and then. And the next, well, the next day, I didn't see Richard at breakfast time. And the next day, we got, we got to the theatre, and I always used to have to go in a bit early to have makeup and stuff put on. And I, I cursed him out. I kind of, you know, said to him, "What, you know, God, you inconsiderate bastard." <laughs> I said, and he said, "What? What? What happened? Why are you cross with me?" And I said, "Because you were playing your freaking guitar at like four o'clock this morning." I wasn't even at home last night, David, was his answer. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely no no explanation to that one. And I have it on good authority from two or three other people that he was out with that night. Yeah. He wasn't at home that night, you know. Uh, but at that time, you know, at that time, I'd be like, but it was like there was a spirit in the house. And the, the one of the weirdest things, the thing that really made us all feel really dumb was Kate, my friend Kate St. John, who was the other person that, that was sharing the house, that we were sharing the house together. She she had hired a car and she would park the car in the, in the driveway. And sometimes she would give me a ride back after, after the show. She would give me a ride back home. So... And uh, every night we we could swear as we drove up that we saw this strange little creature underneath the house, like actually underneath the kind of, you know, the the, the whatever you could like, like the porch board, like the crawl space underneath the house. And we were convinced that we could see these little pink eyes just kind of <laughs> staring out from under this thing and then it would scurry along and you'd see these pink eyes would kind of like come out and then this would have this this happened periodically you know throughout the time we were there and it it, it actually transpired that it was a possum it was an it was an albino apisiac possum Mm -hmm. so it was like a freaking possum with no hair and it was just like so it was like a pink ball possum (laughs) lived under this freaking house so you can imagine it. Look, we were convinced that this thing was like, you know, was the devil. So, uh, yeah. and and then all this other weird shit started happening. Anyway, and then you know it was, um, yeah, it was just really weird. And then all kinds of weird stuff started happening. Like Richard got really sick. Richard hurt his back really badly and had to leave the show and stuff. And it was just all, it was just all like really, really gnarly and really crazy. But it was, yeah. So I mean, that, that they were kind of. When you said about ghost stories, I mean, you know, obviously there's, there are so many that you hear over the years, especially like traveling through, through Ireland and stuff like that. And, you know, the, you know, the Irish are really, they love, they love a good ghost, you know, a good, a good ghost tale, but they were, they were just two that, as I say, they weren't really, they didn't really have massive punchlines, but my God, they were super, super terrifying. And just, you know, I guess, yeah, we. I mean, we couldn't explain why. Still can't to this day. I think most ghost stories, real ghost stories, are like this. Like, there's no, there's not a literary sense to them. You don't, you don't get a nice little bow on top. Um, can I, can I tell you a ghost story about a guitar? Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. It can go into the ghost, in, into the ghostly guitar story box. This is actually, actually, you've only told me the second 
ghostly guitar story I've ever heard in my entire life. So thank you very much. Um, okay, so one of my best friends in my entire life is quite a bit older than me. He's uh, 27 years older than me. I met him when I was 20 and he was 47. Um, and he'd gone to school in Cambridge. Like he attended classes at Harvard. Um, and he had this great apartment. I think he was like the third person to have a lease there since like 1850 or something. Like it was this beautiful old apartment um, with one of those weird toilets that you pull the chain, you know, um, and it had these beautiful built-in bookshelves in the front room. And this is, this is in the, I think, late 60s. He was born in 1949. So he's, you know, college-aged. Um, and he's a hippie and he likes to do acid. Um, and he does one hit of acid, which we all know <laughs> is not going to really mess you up that badly. And he's, you know, he's like, he's good at he's good at this. He's not, he's not like some amateur. So he, uh, waiting for the acid to kick in and he, um, he's going to go out on the town. He's the night owl. He's going to go to some show or something. So he's like taking a bath down the hall and he hears someone in his apartment playing the guitar. So he gets out of the bath, grabs a towel, walks into the front, like up to the front room, and he can see through the reflection in the Glaston bookshelves that Jimmy Rogers, the the Texas brake man, not this Jimmy Rogers dude we were talking about earlier, who who did had a hit with Kisses Sweeter Than Wine. No, it was like the Jimmy Rogers. The, the yodeling, uh, the yodeling brake man, um, America's first, um, like he kind of opened the door to the crooners in a way. Um, he's sitting there on, on the couch playing my friend's guitar. And, um, my friend just took it all in. He decided not to walk into the room went back, got in the bathtub, <laughs> but had like a full on vision. And, you know, if, if it wasn't for the fact that, you know, he's one of my best friends, like, you know, we, you don't have to believe that story, but I have to entertain that that's exactly what happened, you know, but it's, it's, it's extremely striking. He has a really sweet story about his about Jimmy Rogers. His father was his father worked on the King's King's Ranch in Houston, in um in Texas and it was, you know, about the size of about the size of Connecticut, like this gigantic ranch. And the very first time his father heard the radio, it was from a crystal unit that they connected up to the barbed wire fence on King's Ranch. And the very first thing he heard coming through the radio when he was a kid was well, a young man working on this ranch was Jimmy Rogers' voice. Oh, wow. Do you know John Rose? Do you know the man John Rose in Australia, the violinist? Do you know his whole... His ongoing project in australia where he he's a violinist he's a very eccentric violinist who plays violin in, in, in all its forms very experimentally as well as very classically oh i need to, i need to know fe him. he plays fences mm. he plays wire fences and there's a whole there's a beautiful thing to talk to chronos about it when you speak to the chronos guys because they actually did a piece um, based on John Rose's music for Fences, and they actually wow. performed an extract of one, one of the pieces, and they actually made some of the barbed wire frame fences, which they bowed on stage, which they actually bowed on stage. But wow. it's a really incredible, 
it's an incredible project you know talking about sort of ghostly sounds there mm. incredibly incredibly here it's like that real kind of wind in the wires stuff you know? mm. would you would you care to grace us with some sounds some sounds what, do you want me to play my song i would love that or do you just want me to play in the dark on my own i would love it if you just wanted to play in the dark on your own Yeah, thank you so much. Oh, <laughs> 
sang kind of George Carter's version and Michael Hurley's version together. Thanks Michael Hurley for introducing us to the song. That was our Neighborhood Coyotes singing earlier. So a little LAPD helicopter uh, chase. Helicopter action and some nice some nice woofing from the doggy. And this is Stevie Weinstein Bonner. Thanks for being with us. Stories so long. 